Hey, everybody. Uh, so I'm Douglas Rushkoff. I uh, mostly write books and make documentaries about uh, digital society. Um, I was originally a theater director in my uh, in my 20s, and I got fed up with theater because of how elitist it was, at least in America in the 1980s, where people would spend you know, $50 to come see a production of Three Penny Opera. And it felt to me that theater, which, which was originally uh, an almost interactive uh, modality, had become very uh, one directional. We were all telling the same story with the same kind of climax. And uh, really just to help people um, feel good about themselves and not create any political change. You know, there was no, uh, you didn't go to a Brecht show and run out of the theater and throw bricks at windows or anything. You just felt good that you could, you know, cry for gay people or black people. It was a way for liberals to soothe themselves. And um, so just as I was reaching my my peak of, of disdain for elitist arts and theater, um, the, the net came up, you know, real interactivity happened. And I, I guess, with young optimistic eyes, you know, I had my first uh, networking-like experience when I was on a uh, on a terminal, and uh, I had to save my first program that I had written. And I remember I was asked, "Do you want to save it as a, a read-only file or a read-write file?" And it was at that moment, it was as if I had dropped ten hits of acid. And I thought, oh my gosh, media, all media could be saved as read only or read write. And how much of the world that I'm living in has been saved as read only files, but these things could actually be read write files. You know, and, and I looked at everything from, from the, 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 the architecture of buildings and the, the grid pattern of the New York, New York. I lived in New York City and the streets were, you know, they're in a grid in New York. And all of a sudden I realized, oh, they didn't just happen. Someone designed them to be this way. That not all cities are grids. And, and I looked at money saying, well, why is money read only? What happens if money is read right? Well, they put you in jail. That's the only way they could stop money from being a read right medium is by putting people in jail. And who's that? And why does money have to be a monopoly? So I, I, my, my, my eyes opened to the possibility for an open source reality on the one hand, that, that, that everything was up for grabs, that, that all of the stories that we are living are actually um, choose your own adventures. And the second thing that happened to me in those, those early days of networking, when I was on The Well and Echo and the Net Time List, was I, was I was starting to see human society less as a society of individuals competing for scarce things and much more as part of a connected, uh, a connected whole. And yeah, it was a psychedelic vision and a little bit, you know, crunchy and lefty and crazy and new age. But it was also based in what what I saw as a a, a, a more accurate. Is this someone saying to me, make my hide my chat window to make video window bigger? I can. I mean, if I hide my chat window, then I won't see if you send me a message, though. I don't know if that's to me. I can't tell. Well, if it's to me, then someone say so. Um, otherwise, I'll just keep going. So I, uh, where was I? Um, right, so I started to think about human beings as being more connected. I got into the Gaia hypothesis. I started looking at evolution as a team sport, the, the things we know about trees being connected in the soil and sending nutrients to each other that they're not actually, um, they're not actually competing with each other. So I just checking the text here to make sure everything's good. All right. Um, and as I, as I thought about it, it seemed that the, the digital, the, the possibility of digital would uh, both kill capitalism because we would no longer have centralized currencies that could be enforced like that. 
and it could kill the cult of the individual. You know, the the uh, uh, this this uh, you know illusion that we're all living uh, uh, you know quite individually. Oh, now let me see. There's a minute. I'm fine. Okay, it's all good. Um, so it seemed to me that we that the possibility for digital, you know, after reading guys like Norbert Wiener and learning about cybernetics and feedback loops, was that this very linear, unidirectional, growth-based, exponential, uh, uh, kind of uh, tech bro, white male, colonial, westward, uh, uh, time-based expansion was going to end itself. That That cybernetics would create feedback loops and force a kind of circularity, a kind of a karma, a kind of a feedback and iteration that would portend the end of civilization as we knew it and lead to a, uh, a, a connected holism, a, a presentist, non-future leaning, um, essentially uh, in all the best ways, anarchic, uh, anarchic civilization. And so while I'm enjoying all that and starting to write books about here it comes, you know, the new Mondo 2000 Ars Electronica, psychedelic, Timothy Leary, uh, driven, grateful, dead, um, uh, uh, Gaia hypothesis, David Bohm, implicate, explicate, order, fractal reality. Um, there was a whole other group, you know, who saw in the internet a threat to business as usual. A study came out in 1994 that showed that the average internet connected home was watching nine hours less commercial television a week. Right? So that meant war, right? People are online talking to each other instead of watching advertising. And this meant that, that uh, they, they were losing their ability to stoke all of the unnecessary consumption that was required for capitalism to continue. And Wired Magazine came along, and still to me, and I'm not that old, Wired Magazine feels like a late comer to this. You know, They showed up around 1993 and declared themselves, oh, we are the spokespeople for the digital revolution. And they recontextualized the whole thing as uh, surveillance economics, as we are living in an attention economy and while real estate online is infinite, human attention, what they called eyeball hours, are limited. So we've got to create, you know, sticky websites is what they originally called it, you know, sticky websites to capture eyeballs and get more eyeball hours from people. And then eventually um, surveillance and manipulation. And, you know, I remember when, when Timothy Leary used to talk about um, taking acid, which was the closest thing for to my to my mind, you know, LSD is the closest thing to the internet. Um, th those two experiences were so similar for me. When when he talked about LSD, he said the two things that matter most are your set and your setting, meaning the mindset that you go into it with and the setting, the place where you do it. So the original set and setting of the internet was you know expansion of the the human nervous system and the setting was the the uh you know the dorm rooms and clubhouses of the west coast uh counterculture and uh, after wired magazine the set and setting of the internet were um surveillance manipulation and growth based, based exponential competitive capitalism so if 25 years later, the whole world is filled with digital technology and our set and setting were surveillance and control, then no wonder the whole world is now having this extremely bad trip, right? We are, we are trying to run our society on an essentially psychedelic substrate with that set and setting. So now what's happening is we are using technology on humans instead of creating technologies for humans to use. And this is a really dangerous place. It's, it's really an extension, an exacerbation, an amplification of the things I thought the internet would free us from. This very Western understanding of subjects 
an object. If you're not a subject, then you're an object. If you're not the person who's acting, you're the one who's being acted upon. If you're not in command, then you are being controlled. And that all comes, you know, and that's really what my work's been about is to see where did this come from? So we can, I, I can try to almost either mimetically or, or, or magically if necessary, kind of um, undo some of these uh, underlying assumptions. And it seemed to me that one of the big ones was, was empirical science itself. You know, Francis Bacon, the uh, uh, European kind of father of empirical science, what he said what we could do with science, and this is a quote, he said we could take nature by the forelock, hold her down, and submit her to our will. So the guy who's the father of empirical science basically sees science through the lens of a rape fantasy, right? Science is this woman, we're gonna hold her down by the hair and submit her to our will, as if that's what, that's our relationship to the world. And I understand, you know, that, oh, like women and darkness and soil and bugs and witches and forests and the moon and all that. It's like, oh, this is all scary, dark. We don't know what's going on here. Intimacy and wet and moisture and uh, all right. So we're gonna, we're gonna hold it down, right? We're gonna hold it down somehow. And we, we forced that mindset onto the digital. So we see the digital as a way to control the world. I remember when, when Timothy Leary read the book Media Lab by uh, Stuart Brand. It was about MIT's uh, Nicholas Negroponte's Media Lab, which has now kind of gone down in infamy because of the, the Epstein scandals. But when he read that book, he said, these are guys who are trying to recreate the womb that they had maybe bad relationships with their mothers. They never got over the fact that their mother couldn't predict everything they needed when they needed it. You know, they couldn't uh, understand what the child wanted. So they want to create a world with predictive algorithms and robot girls and tubes and things to bring them everything they want, you know, like a womb with a view. So you get a screen and you can just float in your little isolated, um, in your little isolated thing. And, you know, that led led uh, uh, led us, I'll call it us, led our civilization to use technology as, as a way to control uh, uh, people and nature, that we reversed what we would call figure and ground. Instead of it being people using tech, we created techs to use people. So first it was to use women, then it was to control people of color. And now, and the reason why finally people are making little movies and getting upset about it, even in Silicon Valley, is because we're using it on ourselves. We are controlling our own cognition, you know, whether it's um, through um, using uh, B.J. Fogg's techniques in Stanford to, to try to use captology to addict people and to take the, the algorithms from slot machines and put them into our news feeds, or to use big data in this manipulative way where, and we know what's happening on Facebook is they use the data we leave behind us to put us in statistical buckets and then send us uh, um, information and put things on our newsfeed that get us to behave more true to our statistical profiles. The, the object of the game is not just to sell us a particular thing, but to get us to act more like whatever it was they predicted, whether they predicted we're going to get divorced or decide we're gay or go on a diet. They want to get their 80% statistical accuracy up to 85 or 90%. And that means taking the 20% of people that they were wrong about, the 20% of people who were going to, to do some anomalous, different behavior and get them to fall into line. It's, it's quite literally, it's auto-tuning humanity to the quantized places. No, you're like in between this group and that. We've got to auto-tune you to get there. And what is auto-tuning? Auto-tuning is, is erasing soul. You know, can you imagine auto-tuning James Brown or somebody trying to reach up to the note or come down over the note? That's not the noise. The place where you're away from the quantized, uh, the quantized demarcation, that's the signal. That's who you actually are. That's what makes you more than, than a, a, a digital grid. That's what makes you, that's what makes you human. And then meanwhile, these technologies end up enforcing a, 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 a social reality of low rapport. You know, you don't 
actually, I mean, it gets close sometimes, but you don't actually connect with other people online in a way that your body and dare I say soul can feel it. You can't see if their pupils are dilating or, or contracting when you're speaking with them. You can't see the micro motions of their head. You can't see their skin flushing. You can't tell if their breathing is sinking with yours. And those are all of the painstakingly evolved uh, mechanisms that we develop to establish trust between humans. And all of those are, are negated in these spaces. So you might say on a Skype call, you say that you agree with me, and I know that you said that, but I get off the call and my body didn't feel that agreement. The, the mirror neurons didn't fire. The oxytocin didn't flow through my blood. And I get off the call with you and I don't, my, my body doesn't say, oh, that's because I'm using a low resolution technology. No, my body just says, don't trust that person. They say they agreed with you, but they say they agreed with me, but I didn't get the cues you know, to tell me that that's true. So that cognitive dissonance or physical dissonance actually creates distrust. Then the less we trust each other, the more likely we are to make software and, and platforms that manipulate other people because I don't trust them anyway. And even the folks, and you know, I just watched that, that, ugh, that Netflix movie on the social dilemma, which is, you know, all these white tech bros from the worst places saying, oh, I guess it was bad that I tried to manipulate 11 year old girls with, uh, uh, you know, behavioral algorithms. Ah, I'm kind of thinking twice about that. Or, oh, I realize, you know, when I'm manipulating millions of kids, but I don't let my own kids online at all, that maybe I have a double standard. I mean, ah. but they they now they mean well, right? But they still mean well through the lens of uh, uh, of the tech bro. It was through the lens of how do we use technology on people rather than how can people use technology? So they know, oh, look, we use technology on people to make them scared and bad and horrible. Now, could we use technology to make people nice by our definition of nice? And that's what a lot of them are calling, they're calling it plan B, right? Or game B, I think they call it. Game B is this idea that we are going to upgrade humans, right? Instead of downgrading us the way they've been doing for the last 20 years, now they want to upgrade us, which again is that reversal of figure and ground, technology on people, social control. How do we manipulate the masses to be nicer? Just leave us alone is what I'd say. But this is that kind of tech bro, techno solutionist um, uh, uh, solution set. And the reason why they have to use that solution set is because they're still and I don't mean to sound too Marxist here, but they're still capitalist. They still have their stock in Facebook and Google. They still want to somehow do good while still making money in this old fashioned way. That's the, it's the classic neoliberal response to a world gone wrong. And what they won't look at is that there's an underlying operating system that they won't recognize. It's not, it's not the, 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 you know, whether they're on, 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 an, you know, Apache or DOS or Linux or whatever. It's the underlying operating system of exponential growth. Whatever idea they have, they think, how does this scale and create exponential growth? And the reality is, and this is what I think that the crypto anarchist realized in, in the 80s when I was still just, just learning about this stuff, but it was my, my, my most open moment. So I think that's why I took it, took it in so deeply. What they got was that the proper use of technology, the appropriate use of technology will actually slow down the growth of the marketplace because these technologies are distributive and circulatory. They're going to engender uh, uh, you know, what we could call local solutions. They, 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 you know, the, the, the crypto anarchy to me is, is an anarcho syndicalist solution, you know, anarcho syndicalism. I, I didn't know what it was, but I had been, um, I had been doing a talk in, uh, um, Germany, you know, talking about the internet and, and, and everything I was interested in. And this academic guy, he was like a, one of these guys they call like professor doctor, you know, rather than just professor or doctor, the professor doctor, I'm professor doctor or something. And he kind of, and he said, um, my, my good sir, I think you are an, I think you are uh, uh, an anarcho syndicalist. And I was like, I don't know if you, you hum a few bars, you know, I'll try to tell you if I am. Um, but so that night in the hotel, I, I looked up anarcho-syndicalism on Wikipedia and I was like, 
oh yeah, actually, um, this is a good thing. This is a good thing, not a bad thing. All anarcho-syndicalism is, is the idea that you have locally scaled cottage industries all over the place, and they're networked and trading with one another. And that, that, uh, uh, that, that you don't need the sort of top-down capitalist bank-driven, uh, uh, you know, currency-driven uh, centralized economy, that this uh, highly local economy with, with trading uh, almost like kibbutzes, with little trading uh, uh, platform cooperatives will be a, a, a better solution. And, you know, when, when I look at anarcho-syndicalism, I see mechanisms that were repressed way back in that same moment that Francis Bacon was saying that science should be the way we rape nature. That's the same moment that we closed the commons and, and turned it into, uh, uh, you know, chartered monopolies. It's the same moment that we lost local currencies and moved towards, you know, dominant fiat interest-based currencies that you had to pay back money. You know, it's the same moment that the local business reality was replaced by the large national chartered monopolies. And I feel like digital can retrieve these medieval mechanisms, not that we go back to medievalism, but that we retrieve what got repressed during the Renaissance with the invention of the printing press and, and the industrial age. So we retrieve the commons, and we've seen that some with the creative commons and commons-based uh, commons uh, 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 resource sharing. Um, we see it in the rise of, of cryptocurrencies and local currencies, and even just peer-to-peer uh, -peer authentication. Once we do peer-to-peer -peer authentication, we start to realize, oh, we don't need the national central government to somehow uh, uh, verify that we've had a transaction. And we also get, and this is what people don't generally think about with the internet, with the internet, we get a reification of the local reality. Television was the global medium broadcasting that moment, the moon landing or the Olympics or the felling of the Berlin Wall. That's, those are television events. They're global events. The internet is actually highly local. And much of the activism we've seen organized online has been, you know, Tahrir Square. These are, these are local um, events. Even Occupy is so local and grounded in a local reality. And my hope is that through digital tech, we can move finally from a spectator democracy run on television with the values of consumerism and consumer choice to, to a very different civics, to a civics of distributed responsibility, which is what civics really is, individual responsibility for all the others. And that's what digital can actually help realize that I think we had such trouble doing through radio and TV and broadcast media that so favors the, the, the autocrat or the authoritarian regime at the middle who can broadcast, whether it's, you know, Chairman Mao through all those thousands or millions of radio speakers they put through China or Hitler through Hitler through radio or Trump through television. He's not actually a digital candidate. This is a television candidate. That, it's another discussion, but I don't even look at Facebook as digital. I look at Facebook as the television model on digital technology. It's still a surveillance and advertising model on digital where that's not what digital does. What digital does is create an environment with a potential for distributed activity and distributed responsibility. That's kind of the original uh, uh, dream of an anarchic world. It's not everybody out of control. It's everybody has authority and agency and, and sovereignty. And they, they network together into temporary autonomous zones of local, um, local power and, and value exchange. So my hope, and, and this is why I was so excited to see this conference and the, the people listed, you know, are such new ones and old ones from this. Some, you know, some of us from, you know, Eric Raymond and, and, and people who were writing about this in the early 90s and late 80s, along with people who are actually doing it in ways that people like me could only imagine. I can only really, you know, when I look at what's happening, that look at the list of things. These are things that at this point, all I can do is cheerlead, you know, cheerlead and pray for, right? Because as I see it, and I genuinely believe this, that we pushed the digital so far, we pushed capitalism or they, the tech bros, so far in, in the uh, uh, 
No, it wasn't a coincidence. I said his name. I mean, I said I'm 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 talking about the names I saw there and went, oh my God, this is it, right? We we're we're reifying crypto, right? We're reifying the cathedral and the bazaar. This that these are the seminal thoughts. These are the ideas that actually are are are, are positive. They're digital positive instead of this crazy Silicon Valley, you know, uh, uh, surveillance detour that we've been on. So what my belief is is that. We are we are in end stage digital industrialism, end stage digital capitalism, and that these guys pushed it so far. They pushed these technologies so far, so far west. What they didn't realize is what Norbert Wiener told us, that that digital technology feeds back. Digital technology is not linear. It's circular. It's cybernetic. It's going to feed back. It collapses subject and object. It collapses cause and effect. It collapses uh, uh, into karma, if you will, into yin-yang, into circular, into all of the Eastern Tao feedback mechanisms where everything you do is realized in the moment. It retrieves regeneration. It retrieves sustainability. It retrieves life. You know, And to me, that's what crypto anarchy really is all about. And that's why uh, I came here, hopefully, um, to celebrate with you. So maybe that's enough enough of a download from me, and we can uh, we can engage using these beautiful uh, technologies. Amazing! Thank you so much. Uh, so let me ask the audience: uh, Does anyone have any questions or any topics that you'd like to open up? Oh, there are two people. Let me turn the mic over. Great. This is, is this on, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, I can hear you. you can can you, do you have like like I, I don't know if to like to keep my mask on or you can hear me, but you can. Oh, I'm safe. I'm safe here. So I can. But, <laughs> right, right, right. I get that. But can can you see me or or I mean should it be? I can't see. You. Try it though. We could try putting the video on. The sound okay. is really clear. Um, so maybe it'll. Make so it two go. things. I come from the same background that you do. I'm a filmmaker, not a theater director. I am incredibly disappointed in art because actually new voices have to leave there. There's nothing new happening. You have to go somewhere else to do that. So um, I've also seen the social dilemma. I also feel uh, in a similar way than you do when, when you talked about the tech bros and that they want to solve things by relaying basically on capitalism. How can we make more money by being like, I don't know, uh, good people now? <laughs> so then we get yeah. to Jeremy Rifkin and the near zero marginal cost society and the third industrial revolution, basically, which is... Capitalism in itself, uh, apparently there's something about the way it works that when it gets to the optimum welfare, basically, technology got so good, driven by the inherent the inherent like spirit of entrepreneurialism and getting to better prizes and everything and competition. So basically, when technology is as good as to let you not resort, not, 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 to, not to have to resort on the centralized authorities, you get to apparently you get to do your own thing so then we get to the sharing economy and the third industrial revolution and the internet of things being a way to take control back like on ourselves and such like how do you how do you look at the sharing economy and the near zero marginal cost society not as a utopia but as a thing that it's actually working as uh, capitalism soon to be like the the search of profit being defunct in the name in the next like thirty years or something. I mean, it's funny. I read. Uh, I've always liked Jeremy Rifkin's work, but then I read the the zero margin cost society, you know, which and and that book along with uh, George Gilder wrote a book about something life after Google or something like that, sort of looking at the the difference between these giant centralized technology companies and the possibility for, I, in his book, he was writing more about the blockchain and, and, and 3D printing and stuff. And somehow when, when I read these books, I feel like they're, they don't remember what it was like when people, when you would see dot matrix printers and daisy wheel printers on the curb in the street, 
because now people got their laser jets and then you'd see laser jets on the street when people got their real laser printers that that there's so much trash and so much cost it's like the yes i can print something at home but where does the goop come from you know that i'm putting in my printer and are there kids in the congo going down into caves at gunpoint to get this stuff so there's there's this this there's sort of zero marginal cost idea really works for digital products but i'm i keep coming back to the this real world uh, the the management of our soil you know how it's turning into dirt and making us dependent on monsanto to teach us how to grow vegetables on dead soil or um uh, uh the refugee crisis from uh global warming and then the sort of these optimistic visions of you know uh, a zero marginal cost global economy start to look uh, uh, specious suspect to me uh, you know on uh, on the other hand i feel like you know these the the, the digital technologies are so much more and they've always, to me, been so much more about modeling a behavior than actually executing something. So, uh, you know, when when we were first looking at um, at the internet as a social space before the social media came around, and people were 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 thinking, is this the new? Uh, is this the colonial being? Is this the way we wire up the the guy in mind? You know, and finally behave as a single brain. And I would say, no, but I think it's the way we practice. You know, I think it's the way we simulate what it will be like to have a brain, a global brain. But when we do it, it's going to be just our heads connected, you know, or our hearts connected to each other as we'll realize we are an organism. And then we won't need this net to, to be in, in communion or in sync with one another. So I... Uh, I'm very optimistic about these technologies giving us the ability to uh, reinstate local economies and then have those local economies be in communication with each other and model stuff with each other. But the, the vision that I see in, in, in Rifkin and Gilder still feels like the vision of people who were raised in the era of globalism, looking at you know, and global markets and the WTO and all. And uh, that that is um, that is a vision that's that's native to the television media environment and that the digital media environment is going to look uh, is going to look different. And I, I don't mean this in a bad way. And, and I love crypto, but I don't think cryptocurrency is necessarily going to be a very big part of it. I think that cryptocurrency currently and the blockchain currently is still part of this dream to quantify and quantize everything in reality. You know, when I hear uh, uh, Jaron Lanier, who's smarter than me, he is, and probably more loving and all that, and maybe a nicer person. But when I hear him talk about, oh, we're going to use blockchain to get everything we do on the blockchain so that we can be properly compensated for it. I, I start to imagine, you know, okay, if I normally get out of bed on the left side of the bed and occasionally get out on the right side of the bed, that information might be useful to a mattress company. It might be valuable to them. And, and so we could put a sensor on my, on my, you know, internet of things in my room that sees which side I get off and I can get 0.02 cents every time I get out of bed on the other side or every time I break my pattern because that is now new information. So now I'm going to be waking up and optimizing which side I get out of the bed in order to create the most valuable data for the mattress company that's observing me. And it's like, What's going on is we're trying to, you know, uh, uh, define and record more and more of human experience. But the more we record, the more we tend to devalue everything that we can't record, everything that's between those spaces. And to me, that's where life actually happens, that that the most of these solutions are still understanding like they understand time with the ticks of the clock and they miss the space between the ticks. You know, that's the great danger of digital, that we look at the ticks and we miss the space when life is actually happening. So um, 
I mean, that's a long winded answer, but I think the solutions are much more simple. I think the, so, I think that the majority of our life in a crypto anarchic or an anarcho syndicalist reality um, ends up being people together playing guitar and farming and fucking and teaching kids. And then, you know, occasionally using um, digital technology to, um, uh, uh, to network with the rest, to, with the rest of, the, of, of the planet. Thank you for the answer. Uh, if I may just ask you if you could uh, come to the front a bit. If you want to be seen on a live stream, you can also go to the stage. No, 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 no. <laughs> okay. No. okay uh, hello. Uh, I would like to ask uh, hey. if you have any interesting uh, resources about Game B, or if you perhaps uh, can I recommend another person who is uh, who has something to say on this topic. Uh, or if you maybe know a community that expresses some of the values and also do you think that game b is more uh, is completely bottom up or do you think there are some top down mechanisms that need to be somehow uh, uh, incorporated <laughs> before it's yeah. it's a possibility well i mean I don't have a lot of faith in the game B uh, community, as it were. I mean, I think that they mean well, but they are, you know, mostly white tech bros who are like game designers, you know, and I feel like they look at the world a bit like SimCity, like, okay, we can program it this way. Um, and there's this feeling that they still know better. On the other hand, you know, and I speak to them a lot, they, a lot of what they say does also make sense, you know, the 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 main folks doing it are um, there's a guy named Jim Rutt, who was the CEO of the Santa Fe Institute Institute for a while, and he was the CEO of Network Solutions for a while too. Um, there's a guy named Daniel Schmachtenberger or Schmachtenberg, who on the one hand he kind of sells these um, cognitive supplements, and on the other is a kind of philosopher about getting humanity to the next place. Um, uh, Tristan Harris is involved in that and the Center for Humane Technology. So those are, are good trailheads um, for, for this, for the game B thing. I just, um, I don't know. I, I, when I, when I engage with them, I see their good intention, but I always feel like they're being a little bit or a lot too prescriptive and we know better and here's the blueprint for the next civilization it's like no wait a minute you're the guys that fucked up this civilization and now we're supposed to trust you to build the next one i feel like it's something that doesn't even happen that intentionally that architecturally that there is no master plan for a crypto anarchic universe right <laughs> that's part of the point <laughs> there's no master plan there's the distributed uh, uh emergent uh, uh, reality. And the more we can, the more we can uh, uh, tolerate living in the real world, um, the more that these, uh, 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 the, the more that the, the necessary patterns will, uh, uh, you know, kind of foster themselves. Even? Okay, Alexander yeah. here. We've been missing each other several times already. Hey. Uh, I love your critique of the yeah. Game B guys because so, they're best friends to me in America as well. So <laughs> hands up to that. But what I wanted to point out is that uh, I hate the sort of Platonist urban planning attitude that I think drives the Game B movement. And I completely share your sympathy right. in that ca case. And actually, I think it's dangerous. It's outside danger, outright dangerous. And, and the fact that it plays into the virtual signaling of woke culture at the moment as well. It's a really bad combo. Yes. And that's obviously where you know, the algorithm design is going to go. It's like scary already when you do Google search today. It's not, it, the algorithms are not honest to you any longer. The algorithms are really there to nudge you. They love this verb to nudge you and send you in a certain direction. Yeah, you get the doubles. But yeah. if, I, if I sort of turn the bigger picture to the critique towards your vision, if, if I sort of um, be straightforward and call your vision digital Hinduism, <laughs> you know, they were all going to play around little communes everywhere and it's all going to be fun. And at the end of the day, I think the tragedy, though, is that this is a very global thing anyway. And with Netflix and stuff like mm -hmm. that coming around as a 
more sound response to Facebook when we hated talking to each other on Facebook and we're just trolling each other. And Netflix actually came along with winners takes all formulas in terms of talent. Talented scripted series with talented actors, talented stories that actually touched people. And it became a global mass phenomenon. And, and I wonder where in your model are you going to do the storytelling to, for example, young men who are looking for an exodus or a dream, dare we say utopia, in response to the current lynch mobs that are actually plaguing the internet at the moment. Because my skepticism towards a digital Hinduism is that it's pagan. And if it's pagan, it's going to be filled with lynch mobs rather than all those little clever little villages and, you know, what everybody's playing along with you portrayed. I don't think we're going to sit and play guitars with each other, actually. I think the real scare, what scares the shit out of me is that a flat universe, a flat internet today is going to be a lot more about lynch mobs and scapegoats than it's going to be about people playing guitars to one another. Can, can, you, can you see connection, if yeah. I ask you? towards some kind of exodology or an exodus myth or something like that that ties into something more utopian in response to the Game B guys so we can sort of pull the rug underneath them with something better than what they do. But it's not just guitar playing in communities. You see what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's why, you know, uh, uh, I mean, in some ways, my my Judaism is so embedded in my worldview, maybe too much, that I kind of take that, I take that aspect for granted because it's so ingrained, you know, that, that I, I'm, I mean, I'm not like a monotheist like that, but the, the, you know, the idea of the law and an ethic, and I'm from this very patriarchal tradition. So I guess I always err on the side of just tearing that all down um, when that's not actually what I would mean. I mean, when I talk about civics as responsibility, I mean that, really in pretty stark contrast to, you know, what we might call friendship civics or hippie civics, that having responsibility means experiencing responsibilities for the people we hate, not just the people we like. You know, the, the Rodney King, why can't we all just get along? Oprah Winfrey, hands across the world, uh, political reality is, is crap, right? That won't, that won't work either. The object of the game is not to like each other. The object of the game is not to kill each other. Um, so you're right. And I, I think that, you know, as I look at, uh, I know I've got friends working in, um, in uh, 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 online radicalization and, and how that happens. And a lot of it seems to be um, guys in their teens and early 20s want a potent male role model. They want a, a non-castrated male role model. And that's part of what makes them fall into, you know, the alt-right or ISIS or, you know, whichever radicalized group is going to provide even, I mean, God knows, you know, what, but, but Trump, uh, it gives them the, the illusion of the male who hasn't been castrated, who refuses not to say whatever he wants and to grab whatever pussy he wants and all that. And that um, activates them. So, you know, what we need instead is some kind of a, 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 a replacement for and a reification of the the true male, you know, uh, you know, and and not to get Hindu on you, but some real yoni and lingam, you know, <laughs> understanding here, you know, uh, uh, tantric practice maybe, um, but something that that somehow acknowledges that, and yeah, and and if we can do it as an acknowledged social construction, then. Of course, we need hierarchies. We can't make it flat. Of course, we do hierarchies. But, you know, that was the whole joke in, in Torah, not to get Jewish on you, but in Torah, as opposed to Hinduism, you know, Samuel is the prophet and, and the people keep, the Israelites keep saying, look, we want, um, we want a king. We want a king. And Samuel keeps talking to God and says, what do I do? They want a king. And God keeps saying, just tell them they don't need a king. A king is stupid. You don't want a king. And Samuel says, no, but they're insisting they really want a king. So God tells Samuel, he says, all right, go pick the tallest guy. You know, and he said that as if to say, I think, as if to say, it's completely arbitrary who you pick as king. Make it a social construction. Put the crown on the guy. So whoever's got the crown is the king, right? They're not the king. They're the king. So if we could play that way with social hierarchy, I think we end up um, in a much better place than, you know, with people who have a billion dollars actually um, being essentially better off 
in this world um, than people who don't get it, you know, in this survival of the fittest dog eat dog, um, uh, uh, you know, game of competitive capitalism, which is justifying itself on bad evolutionary science. Um, but that doesn't mean there's still not some competition, that there's still some hierarchy in this. It's just as conscious human beings, we have to learn to mitigate as many of the of the downsides of competitive uh, uh, of a competitive world, you know, with, um, you know, uh, some some uh, uh, at least cooperation, at least civic responsibility, even if, you know, I hate that guy over there who's got the the pizzeria that's competing with mine, you know, but I agree with you. Uh, a lot of what I said today can sound particularly where I'm coming from right now in Trump land. Um, I'm probably erring a bit on the side of um, this almost Eastern style, you know, uh, non-hierarchical, you know, landscape of cybernetic loops, um, you know, and, and negating the fact that even a fractal will create a shape, you know, even a fractal will have um, what could be understood as, as hierarchies. It's not just, no, it's not just, you know, ping pong balls on a flat, on a flat landscape. So I, I agree with you there. Thank you. Uh, there is one last question because we are uh, at our time uh, from the chat. Uh, Douglas, what was your project at the Institute for the Future? Uh, not sure what. Um, well, it's interesting. I wrote a book in 1993, I guess, uh, four called Media Virus, which kind of launched the viral, the, the language around viral media. And uh, they were doing, you know, it was after Trump was elected and, and the breakdown of all the social media networks and everybody realizing about, you know, the danger of weaponized memetics. And they wanted me to do a report on you know what to do about uh, you know kind of weaponized memetics, and uh, you know what the, the the work that I did, and it was based on what I was thinking back then, is that it's not about trying to develop technologies that somehow filter the memes, although it's a nice idea. That the real thing we have to do, it just like anybody being attacked by a virus, the thing we have to work on is our collective cultural immune response. How do we have a positive immune response? How do we learn to recognize dangerous mimetic structures so that they don't um, replicate, so that we don't spread them? How do you strengthen your immune system? Do you do it with homeopathic doses of, uh, of dangerous memes? Or do you do it by, by um, I think, by having a good public conversation about the kinds of issues that memes are meant to? to trigger, you know, because a media virus won't spread unless it's uh, triggering some unresolved cultural issue about race or gender or economics or sex or something. Um, it means that there's something that we're not talking about that we need to. Um, so that was sort of that was sort of the gist of it, not to take responsibility away from the platforms for uh, monitoring activity rather than just making money off off horror. Um, but that that what we have to look at is uh, sort of our our education and social reality in order to create a more uh, a, a, a better uh, cultural and cognitive uh, immune immunity apparatus. All right, we are at our time. Um, let me thank you for joining us here at HTPP. Um, thank you. Thanks everybody in the audience. Um, thank you. Please carry on. Thanks so much. Thanks so much for what you're doing.